Uh, my name is Patrick Wiseman. A little bit about myself. I'm, I'm a, a law professor with a propensity to code, um, which means that I don't know nearly as much as many of you who are actually paid to code know. I'm, um, but I, this is a, this, the look of this is, is a deliberate um, reference to a presentation that I gave in, at the 2012 CaliCon. Um, so I'm going to say a bit about that. Studies show that intelligent people, when confronted with text, have a tendency to read it. Those are the, you, those are the um, classic 1950 serial box studies. You'll remember those, right? Everybody tends. Studies also show that people don't like to have text read to them. So I'm, I'm going to try to avoid as much as possible reading any of this text to you. It's in the nature of a tutorial slash presentation. Um, but what I'm really going to, the, the way I'm going to present it is to talk to you about my experience in having made the decision to convert some of my course websites to web apps and then learning about progressive web apps and the contrast between those and what I talked about in 2012. So I'll, some of you may have been here back in 2012 when I talked about, in fact, I recognize some faces who almost certainly were here back in 2012. At that time, I, I did a presentation on how to convert a website to a Chrome app. And my, and my motivation there was principally to convert um, course websites into Chrome apps. I, I did a presentation some years ago uh, which I called the, the Rich Syllabus. And I will actually have occasion to show you a couple of my syllabi in a moment, which I am considering converting to web apps. The Rich Syllabus is a syllabus which basically has, it looks like a syllabus on the surface, but every item on the syllabus then itself links to a web page which describes what's going to be done in that particular class and also in my case links to edited versions of the cases. So it's a, it's, it's a, a substitute for a casebook. It was useful, I thought, to my students to be able to convert that to a Chrome app because what a Chrome app did was zip it all up into a, into a zipped all the web content in, into a container which then could be could sit on their desktop and they wouldn't have to have any internet access in order to, in order to get into it. Um, Google announced, I think maybe late last year, that they were going to abandon the, the Chrome app, which I would, they'd already made it rather difficult to, to install it anyway. They, they got worried about the security of it, so you had to stick it in the Play Store. You couldn't sideload it without a whole lot of difficulty anyway. But for about three years after two, my 2012 presentation, I did provide my students in both my Constitutional Law 1 and my Constitutional Law 2 classes with Chrome apps so that they could work offline. Because all of my course content is online. So, so this actually, this page is, is a sort of uh, retrospective of why it was a good idea to convert it to a Chrome app. And then I thought, well, okay, as, as of about today, roughly, um, Google has given up on Chrome apps. The support was going to run out sometime in June. Now, interesting, I, I just read about, within the last hour, a story in, in Gadget, the headline of which is, Chrome OS, I'm using a Chromebook here, by the way, just, just to prove the power of the Chromebook. It's, a, it's an incredibly useful, this is my teaching machine. I, I, I take this into class every day and, and teach from it because all of my material is, is web-based and, I can, and I, so I pull up my notes and it, it's very useful. It, it, you'd be amazed at how useful a Chromebook can be, but it's about to be even more useful because Google has announced that Chrome OS is fixing its app problem with progressive web apps so that um, lots of sites out there can now convert their web content into a progressive web app. And, what's, and I'll, I'll talk more about what's cool about a progressive web app, but one of the things that's cool about it is that it behaves on 
most devices very much like a native app. It just sort of sits there on the home screen, and when you pull it up, it comes up just the way a native app would, would come up. That said, as I, as I, um, I, 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 th I thought it was a pretty cool, as, as I say, I, I, as a law professor with a propensity to code, I tend to do things because I can, not because it makes any sense to do it, right? I mean, because I just, so I've been doing that for decades. I, I don't remember the first, I think the first Cali conference I probably ca I came to was probably the fifth, I'm thinking, probably. Um, so I've been, and I've been coming pretty much ever since. I've missed one or two. But, I, but as I say, I, I have this tendency to do things because I can, not because it makes any sense to do them. But at this, I'm, I'm, and so part of what I'm going to talk about today in terms of learning how to, about progressive web apps, I'm going to seriously ask the question, is it really worth the trouble? Uh, and I'm, I'm not convinced that it is, but, I'm, but there's a steep learning curve to, to figure out how to create a progressive web app in the first place. I'm sort of, I'm, I'm sort of cresting <laughs> on that learning curve, so lots of you probably know a whole, a whole lot more about making progressive web apps than I do, but I just thought, thought it might be worthwhile sort of talking about my experience. One of the things I said back in 2012 was that I preferred a Chromebook to an ebook because at that time the EPUB 3 specification for ebooks was hardly supported anywhere. What's interesting about the EPUB 3 specification for ebooks and Chrome apps is that they're actually very similar. I suspect, I have no basis for saying so, but I suspect that Google has abandoned the Chrome app because it is basically it basically does the same thing as an ebook. What, what the ebook does, I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, but just comparing progressive web apps and ebooks. But what the ebook is is exactly what a Chromebook was, which is a zipped up website. Ebook people don't like you to describe ebooks as a zipped up website, but that's basically what it is. So, what the heck is a progressive web app anyway? I think it's a very strange use of the word progressive. It's, it has absolutely no political content at all, which is fine. I don't mind that it lacks political content. But I, what a progressive web app is, is a, is, a, is a web app that whatever device you pull it up on, it will, it, it will decay <laughs> elegantly. That is, if, you're, if your browser or your device doesn't support the full panoply of things that are provided by a progressive web app. And, and what you've provided is a progressive web app which does all the things that a progressive web app can do. It's caching, it works offline, it can send push notifications and all of that. If you're sending it to a device that doesn't support that, it will still function as a website. It'll, because it is basically a website, or it's a way of delivering web content. So it's progressive in the sense that it gets progressively more functional as, as the devices or the browser that it's being invoked by can accommodate the, the, um, the capacity of the, of the app. I think that's a very funny use of the word progressive, but there you go. There are two things about the, about the progressive web app. The first is a manifest file. Now, if, if, you've ever, if you've ever made a Chrome app or an e-book or, e, or a, not a Chrome app, but just a, a, a web app that isn't progressive, you're probably familiar with the manifest file. It's a file, it's a JSON file, that is, it's got key, you know, keyword and value, and it's just got a whole, it's, it's a very simple thing, and I'll show you an example. I'll show you this, um, the manifest that goes with this app in a moment. So that's a fairly familiar thing. The thing that's unique about progressive web apps is this creature called a service worker, um, which I'll say more about. It's the thing that makes the progressive web app do all the things that it's able to do, that, that, that's 
enables it to function very much like a native app because it can it can do things that web apps couldn't do. It can it can it, again it can cache off content offline. It can send push notifications which native apps can do and web apps have not been able to do. But the service worker enables all of that stuff. This was the piece that for me was the steepest part of the learning curve, was figuring out. Uh, uh, that's what the service worker is and figuring out how to how to write the thing to get it to do what I wanted it to do. I started out with some misapprehensions and so as, as I say that I'm partly talking here about how how I learned what I learned about progressive web apps. One of the things that is especially useful about progressive web apps is that they can as I've said, cache the content, the online content, and store it on the device. So that if you happen to be offline, or what the progressive web apps like to call a victim of Li-Fi, where it looks as if you've got bars, but there's just nothing, there's just nothing happening. A progressive web app, one of the principal features of it, or one of the features that people like to promote about it is that it works well offline. Even when you've got Li-Fi, you know, bars but no real action, it will actually function. Now, I was under the impression that, well, well then uh, lots of websites are dynamic and lots of websites are static. And what I mean by that distinction is a static website is one where the HTML pages are just sitting there on the server and when some browser shows up, those HTML pages are delivered. They don't, nothing, there's no, nothing going on, nothing interesting, well, I shouldn't say that, but there's nothing going on on the server to, to govern the content. Whereas a dynamic website, which most are, probably with an, an opening page that says, this is old school. If it says index.cgi, you know you're dealing with an old school website. It might be index.php or, or anything, something that's, that's doing something on the server to generate the content and then deliver it as opposed to just having the content sitting there waiting for you to, to pull it off the server, as a static website does. I'm, and I'm using static as static on the server. It may not be static in the browser, because there may be some client-side JavaScript going on, making it not static on the, on the client side, but it's static on the server side. I was under the misapprehension. I said, well, I thought to myself, well, how on earth can... I was just learning that service workers can cache content. I thought, well, how, how can a service worker cache dynamically generated content? It's, it's regenerated every time. Well, it turns out the service worker is pretty smart. As long as you use the right kind of request to pull the data, which is to, a GET request, as opposed to a POST request, which you can use POST requests, actually, to, but don't worry about it. As long as you, you use a, a GET request, Get requ post requests are not cached, but get requests are. So if you've got a complicated, actually, I'll go, I'll go off full screen for a moment. Um, and if you, I've, the, the URL for this has a has a whole string of characters after it that are saying pull the data from the message number that has that number, and then it also that you can't see it, but it also it then has an index to all the other messages in the associated with this site. And it's in the form of a get request. And, it, and the underlying, the service worker will cache that get request. It'll be with, with the, uh, the long, there's a limit to how long the get request can be apparently, but I'm not quite sure what that limit is. But it will in fact remember it so that when you pull up the page the next time, depending on your caching strategy, and I'll talk about that in a moment, it, will, it might, rather than pulling it from the network, it'll, it'll pull it from the cache. That is to say, you don't need to go off out to get it. It's already sitting there on your device. So if you're in one of these Li-Fi situations, not to worry, because the content will, will be there. So my misapprehension was that dynamic websites wouldn't cache, but they do. Um, and what's interesting about that is a static website, because it's a static website, the HTML is just sitting there waiting, and it just gets delivered when the browser shows up. 
static websites tend to deliver their content pretty efficiently because there's nothing going on under the hood. There's no pulling stuff out of a database or, or running stuff through a template and all that kind of thing. So a static website will deliver the content pretty quickly. A dynamic website can, tend to, can slow down, can, can deliver content relatively slowly because it's, because it's, pulling, it's you know, pulling up a template and then it's pulling up data into that template and populating the template and then giving you the page. That takes time. We're talking milliseconds, but apparently users get frustrated even when it takes milliseconds for a page to render. If you're, um, if you're using a progressive web app, that content gets cached and it gets delivered immediately. There you go. There we go. So that was by, by way of a little bit of background on what these things are up to. You'll need a website suitable for conversion to an app. I'm, um, I don't know whether, I don't know, is this website, so this, this presentation is a website. Um, I don't know if it's suitable for conversion to an app, but it gets converted to an app, as you'll see. A, a website that probably isn't suitable for conversion to an app is my um, syllabus for the fall of this year in Constitutional Law 1, which is not quite up to date yet. Um, as, a, as a web page, it's okay. I mean, it's got a fair amount of content there. As a web app, I think I need to do some work. I, need to, I think I need to write a front page to it that, that's less. I have nonetheless written the, the manifest and the service worker, so this, in fact, will work as a web app, but it's not a very satisfactory web app. It needs some work to make it, to make it satisfactory. You also, um, I, I just, uh, this is a bit sort of under the hoodish, I guess, but in, in, order, to, in order to develop this um, content, a progressive web app will only work if it's served under the HTTPS protocol. That's partly because the service worker sits between the, the browser and the, between the server and the browser, and it, it provides all kinds of useful opportunities for hackers to get in, get in between um, the, the client and the server. So it, so it has to be served. It won't work unless it's served using the HTTPS protocol. At first, I didn't have the HTTPS protocol, but one of my IT folks got me the certificate, and so now my server is, is delivering using the HTTPS protocol. But fortunately, you can, you can develop without having the HTTPS protocol because your local host, if you have a web server on your laptop, your local host is, for development purposes, treated as secure. I have no idea what, how many of you have any interest in developing on a local host. There's a thing, there's a thing called an extension for Chrome called Web Server for Chrome, for, which is cross-platform, which will function as a local host. So you can actually do your development of your HTML and CSS and JavaScript actually on, on your any old computer and, and tell Web Server for Chrome where to find that site and it will deliver it up and you can and you can test it and use it you know see if it's functioning as a um, progressive web app if you're on a Linux box which I usually am uh, I haven't tried uh, I, I didn't develop this on the Chromebook I'm not that silly um, although you, I could have have put no, probably not but if you're on a Linux box you already have you almost certainly already have a web server just sitting there on your on your laptop um, and I've noticed I took I took a course by the way because this was this was um, the more I thought about this. Once classes were over, students were taking exams, so I had a few weeks to really take this seriously. And I realized what that I I I said I'll do a presentation on converting websites to progressive web apps. And I, thought, I started getting into it once I had the time to do it, and I. Thought, geez, I've bitten off more than I could chew here. So I took a—I don't know how you pronounce Udemy. Is it Udemy or Udemy or whatever it is? I took a Udemy course on progressive web apps, and it was actually very interesting and very informative. I'm only about halfway through it, so I still don't know how to do push notifications, but caching—I'm pretty good on. 
So, so I did that, and one of the one the reason that I mention that is is that um, npm, which is a package manager with which comes with Node.js, which is not something I use, but it's very useful to create a and this is cross-platform too. You can set up a local server, local host server to do the development, but that's that's too much under the hood. And I recommend the Chrome web browser. I'm going to I'm going to go even further under the hood in a moment. I'm going to some of you are already familiar with the Chrome development tools, but I'm I'm going to show you how the Chrome development tools will give you information about about your progressive web app and how it's how it's doing and whether it's complying with standards. So again, this is this is sort of a, a retrospective to what I did in in 2012 with respect to Chrome App. I had nine easy steps to convert a website into a Chrome App. There are fewer steps here, but they're but then no easier. The, the as I say, the learning curve is fairly steep. You need web content, obviously. Um, if, if you're developing a web app from scratch, then there are all kinds of things you might think about in terms of making the web content specifically suitable for mobile apps. Um, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm developing, to the extent that, I'm, that I conclude that I am going to provide my students with progressive web apps for my syllabi, I didn't start out with content that was particularly suitable for mobile. I will say this though, my websites tend to be very simple. That is, I don't have all kinds of bells and whistles and tables and frames and all that kind of nonsense. Uh, so they tend to be very simple. So they do in fact render on mobile devices just fine. Um, so, but they're not, they're not optimized by any means for uh, mobile use. But if you're creating from scratch, it's basically HTML5, CSS, JavaScript. The usual stuff that we all use, unless you're a faculty member who's thinking, what, what on earth is he talking about? But maybe, you know, if, if, if you do have course websites, you might find this a useful thing to know about. I have absolutely no artistic talent. So I, st I started out, um, and one of the things that you have to have in order for your progressive web app to work is a collection of icons of various sizes. So I, so I went into the, the unfortunately named GIMP, <laughs> the GNU Image Manipulation Program, which is an open source substitute for Photoshop. And which is also a cross-platform, I'm pretty sure. I use it on Linux, of course, but, um, but it's, it's available cross-platform. So I went in there and I started trying to figure out how to design a, a nice uh, icon for my apps or app. And I have absolutely no artistic talent, and the GIMP is very complicated. And so I gave up, and I googled how to draw with CSS. And you will be amazed at the things that people draw with CSS the cascading style sheets. The HTML is basically a div with an ID and the rest is CSS. And there are people out there drawing absolutely extraordinary things just using CSS. I mean, it, it's some amazing stuff. Go, Google drawing with CSS and you'll see some pretty amazing things. Th this, these things are not amazing at all. But I was able to create a, a square um, picture with, with a bar in the middle with the, with a background color and the text right justified. That's sort of my brand. My students would recognize it as my, all of my, my case edited cases, for example, have a title bar at the top with a background color and the title of the case right justified. So I thought, okay, that, that's what I'll do. I'll have a a bar with right justified text. So the, the icon for this for this website presentation, which will be converted into a progressive web app, is PW apps. 
that's the, because I'm PW, Patrick Wiseman, and besides it stands for Progressive Web Apps, and I thought that's just cool, so, that, so, yeah, so good enough, right? And the one on the right is for my Constitutional Law 1 syllabus. So what I now have is a little factory for producing icons that look like this. Not that they're great or anything, um, but I have this little factory where I have a template, which is the HTML, and I, then I have the CSS where I can define the background color and the text, and I can just turn them out. And then I did use the GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program, to pull up the the square thing that I have, made the, make the top and bottom um, transparent, and so that's what we end up with. And then I learned that iOS hates, trans, uh, hates any icon with transparency. Um, I'm not going to worry about that for now. Maybe if I have a bunch of students who are, who are on iOS and, and it somehow doesn't work for them, I'll figure out a way. You need to create at least one icon, 512 by 512. The, the, I, I'll demonstrate right at the end the, the audit tool that's built into Chrome called Lighthouse. Um, there's some dispute among people who create progressive web apps as to whether the 512 by 512 is all you need. Lighthouse says it's all you need. Uh, others say, no, you need, you need the 192 by 192, which is favored by Android, and you need the 144 by 144, which is favored by iOS, and you need, and, but Lighthouse says that that the 512 by 512 will do it and that the operating systems will adjust. And if you'd rather not create your own, there are oodles of, of sites around the internet with free, as long as you give them credit, icons. So you upload the icon to your server and then now we're getting, down, now we're getting to the nitty gritty where we're, we're creating the files that we've got the web content and now we're creating the files that are necessary to convert this web content into a web app. I'll just show you, I know some people, I see someone in the center of the room who doesn't like to look at code, because <laughs> he said so yesterday. Probably see more than one. <laughs> <laughs> probably so, but well, yeah, probably so. But I'll, I'll just, this is a very simple, um, example of a manifest file. As I said, it's in JSON, which is to say it's got a keyword and a, and a value. And one of the things that I'll just I'll just point out in particular is is the um, display. There are various options there. If you if you if you make the display standalone, then when when it when you've got it functioning as an app, the, the web page will come out up without any of the Chrome, as they call it, that, that is without any of the stuff. So it, so it starts even now to look much more like an app. If any of you have installed the CaliCon18 dot shed, that's, that's, they, they call it an app. But you might have, at least on my Android phone, when I install it, I, I get a little logo on my, um, on my home screen but with a little Google Chrome dot on it. It looks, in, in other words, it, it functions, if I have Chrome open on my phone, or, or I have Chrome, and I'm, I'm one of these people with tabs everywhere, right? So even on, even on my phone, my Chrome has about 17 tabs open. <laughs> so, so when I invoke the, the CaliCon 18 schedule thing, it opens up in my Chrome browser. So they didn't choose display standalone. They must have chosen display browser because it just opens up as if it were in the browser. It gives, so it gives you quicker access to it because it's sitting right there on the homepage. You don't have to get, you know, figure out where, how to open the, um, the website again, but it, but it isn't standalone. So sorry to bore you with, the, with, with that code. I, I just want to say something as an aside if, if your site uses authentication, good luck developing a progressive web app. My syllabus uses authentication. I went through all kinds of, the first time I, I, I created the manifest and the service worker for my syllabus, and, and I, I, well, I, first of all, I created the manifest, didn't worry about the service, but I created the manifest, um, tried, tried to pull it up in Chrome, <coughs> and I um, apologize, I'm going to go under the hood and show you the, um, the Google developer, developer tool, Control-Shift-I opens the 
Google Developer thing. When I and, and it will show you if you've got a manifest, it'll it'll show you the manifest and all the all the stuff that's in it. When I did that after having created what I knew to be a perfectly good manifest file for my syllabus, what I got was 401 unauthorized instead of the manifest, even though I had already authenticated to the site. So I'd authenticated to the site, but the manifest file wasn't wasn't uh, coming up. And that's because, well, it, I, I had to put in cross-origin equals use credentials to get it to do that. You also need to do stuff in the service worker to make it use credentials. And even that won't work because when I pull up the password protected web app, unless I'm at that time authenticated to the website, it generates a 401 error, doesn't prompt for credentials, and there's no way to there's no way past that. There's no way past the 401 error unless you, you go back into the browser, open the site in the browser, authenticate against the browser, and then the progressive web app knows that you've done that. But that sort of kind of defeats the purpose just a little bit. That was more than you wanted to know. So now we've created a, 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 a manifest file. Woohoo! <laughs> We've created a web app. You remember back in oh, back in the day when the PC first came out. Um, some of you will remember back in the day, early eighties. Personal computers. People with a personal computer. Who the hell needs a personal computer? What are you going to do with a personal computer? I'm going to catalogue my recipes. Everybody said, <laughs> and nobody did, except me. <laughs> I catalogued my recipes. Well, you can't really see that very well, but I borrowed a cookbook logo from, from, from the web. So I, I created a manifest file for my, for my um, recipe collection, which sits on a server that's in my house and accessible to me through a DNS alias uh, thing. So I can pull it up from wherever I happen to be. And you'll notice that it has the, the because it's just a manifest file, it's a web app. But it's, but it's sort of functioning like a Chrome bookmark. It's, 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 a, it's sort of a glorified bookmark. It saves you the trouble of going into the browser and pulling up and you know, remembering the, the address. It also, in my case, since I gave the manifest display standalone, my recipes come up without any of the browser Chrome around it. So I've got about 1,275 or so recipes in this, in this database. And at this point, you don't um, you don't need the HTTPS protocol for this for a web app so far. Yet we haven't we haven't yet done what's unique about progressive web apps, which is introduce the service worker, which does a lots of lots more work. But we've but we've created a web app. It's not a hugely impressive web app, but it's a web app. Now the next step is to create the service worker, and this is. I'm, I'm going to try not to go under the hood too much here, but just describe a little bit about what what the service worker does. It, it sits between your client browser and the outside world. And it <coughs> sort of functions, as I say up there, it sort of functions like a programmable proxy. It intercepts every call to the internet as long as you call it in every page from which you want it to be called. True of the manifest as well, by the way. You have to have a, that link to the manifest that appears in the head of the document. It has to appear in every page, which is why it's particularly useful, as I have, to have a content management system that's template driven so that you can stick that link just in, in the template and it'll distribute across the site. Similarly for the service worker, you have to invoke it in every page. It's capable of controlling every page under its directory, but it's not going to control any page under its directory in which it's not properly invoked. So it has to be invoked by a, by a call to register it. And it, it pops in and out of existence. It, it will 
I mean, it's it's there, but it'll stop running if it's not being invoked. But the moment, uh, but at the moment a call goes out to the internet from one of these pages that it, it controls, it will wake up and, and take care of it. Which is interesting when you're developing, by the way, because um, it does it, once the service worker is there, it's there. And it's there on the website. It's not just there in the web app. It's sitting there on the web so I'll demonstrate in a moment what that, why that might throw you while you're developing. Um, so that, that's enough about, what, about where it goes. So there are various caching strategies that, that sort of depend on the nature of the content. One of the things that's recommended by people who create progressive web apps, and I learned this from the Udemy course and various other places where I've been reading about it, one of the things that's recommended is that you, when you install the service worker, that you immediately go out and get core resources so that those core resources are already cached on the device. I won't try to define what core resources might be, but they might include images that show up across a lot of pages, for example, or various other things that, that, you, that you want to be cached that will make that will enable the the web app at least to, to look functional when you're <coughs> offline. The problem with that is that if if your list of core resources is too long, well, not too long, but but if you have a long list of core resources and any one of them fails to be retrieved from the network, the service worker will fail and the web app will revert to a, a web app with no service worker. So it won't have any of the caching or the push notifications or any of that. So you need not to put too much in your, in your list of core resources for fear that the whole thing will not work. But anyway, the various ca caching strategies. A couple of uh, strategies are called offline first. One of the things that people advocate about progressive web apps is that they work offline and they, so the best strategy is offline first, which is obviously a misnomer because if you don't go online first, you've got nothing, you've got nothing there, right? You have to go get it first. So you're always online first, but once you've been to get it, now offline first is a good strategy. I'm going, to, I'm going to illustrate, forgive me again for going under the hood, I'm going under the hood in my own content management system which is a mess underneath the, underneath the hood, so just ignore what it looks like. So I'm, I'm, going, I'm going in here to edit, uh, I'm going to edit out the reference to allow me to illustrate the effect of the caching strategy by editing this slide. I'm just going to delete that so it's not there anymore. What the hey? It's still there. It's still there because of my caching strategy. My caching strategy is to retrieve content from the cache first and then refresh from the network. So if I now reload this page, I've re so now what's sitting in the network is the current version of the page where that content is no longer there. But it retrieved from the cache first and then refreshed the cache from the network so that what appeared was the cached page first. And that's why it works well offline because if I, if I dare I do this, dare I go under the hood one more time, one of the, thing, one, one of the cool things about developing with the Google development tools is that it allows you to fake being offline. So I can go in here and check offline and it will pretend to be offline. Now here's a, one of those things that will get you. If I do control shift reload, I get that. Wait a minute, isn't this supposed to work offline? Well yeah, but I, what I just did was a, was a hard reload if I do a soft reload, it will load from the cache. That really bugged me for a while, right? I did Control Shift R to reload, and it told me that it was cached in the order, and it wasn't, and, and I got the 
but if you do a soft reload, it, sure enough, it is in, in the cache. After all, I know you're relieved to know that. <laughs> so anyway, when, when it comes to, to, to choosing your caching strategy, it sort of depends on, on the nature of the content. If you've got a lot of stable content, then it makes sense to go offline first. If you've got a lot of dynamically, rapidly changing content, some of it might make sense not to cache. You, you might just want to go get it from the network. And if it happens that the user is in a Li-Fi situation, you can, you can, there are ways that you just acknowledge that you're in that situation, but not deliver, not deliver old stale content, but just tell them we'll refresh when we're back online. So once you've, I, I deliberately did not show you the code for the service worker, and you're glad of that. <laughs> what you, what you, you invoke, the, the way that the service worker gets invoked is that it's, uh, it, it's, you have a, a, something embedded in the head section of your pages. And again, if you're using a content management system that's template driven, it's easy just to stick it in the template and it'll propagate over the whole site. Um, I won't show you the code to register it. it just, um, it's, pretty straightforward if you go to uh, if you just google how to register a service worker it'll probably tell you how to do that so once you once you've done all that now you have a progressive web app which i was uh, when i when i created the the web app you will get that your user will get prompted to install the app to the home screen but you have absolutely no control over when that happens there's there are sort of some criteria the vague criteria if you revisit the page more than five minutes apart and then you might get offered the opportunity to install it to your home page and if you decline that opportunity you will never be offered that opportunity again when i created the the um, manifest and service worker for my constitutional law syllabus, the first time I pulled it up, it offered to install it to my home screen, because obviously I've, I, I go there all the time. And so I installed it to my home screen. Um, but it doesn't always, you, you don't have a whole lot of control over that. But you do have the option, or we should have the option here. Right, this, this, um, this, site is called proof the long name you might you probably didn't notice but the long name in the in the manifest file was proof of concept pw apps and now because it's got the manifest and the service worker it's got all the things necessary to function as a progressive web app i'm offered the option to install it so i'm going to do that and it pulls it up because i've just installed it it now comes up as in my as the app. But I'll go back to it in the... Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> it's disappeared. It's not there anymore. Well, actually, let me go back here. And if if you're looking at a website, this this, as I say, I created a manifest and and service worker for this. And so, because it's already installed, now when you go here, it offers you the option to open it in the app that's already installed. This is my Constitutional Law two syllabus. Haven't done anything with this. Haven't created any. This is the last last spring. Haven't put a manifest or a service worker here. And so all you get here is the option to create a shortcut, which which is neither here nor there. Who cares? <laughs> so let me bring this guy back up. So are these things going to be around for long? Google has a sorry history of abandoning stuff that works. I, I know I put Google Wave up there and you're all thinking, wait a minute, Google Wave worked? <laughs> Google Wave was a lot of fun. But no, it probably wasn't, didn't turn out to be very useful. But, but, they, but they've given up on a lot of stuff. Um, 
But as I say from this Engadget story, they seem to be committed to progressive web apps. One of the things that somebody, somebody asked me in, back in 2012, why did you bother to convert your website to a Chrome app? It's, it's old technology, it's on the desktop, it'll never go mobile. And my prediction at the time was, well, desktops are going to be around for a very long time, so we don't have to worry about that. And I proved to be right about that. In the, I mean, we still got the equivalent, at least, of desktop PCs. But I also predicted that Google would go mobile with Chrome apps, and they never did. They, they've now abandoned them, but they're going mobile with progressive web apps. So they've given up on all kinds of stuff. They gave up on Google Reader, damn it. They've given up on Chrome apps, the Google URL shortening service. If you've got one, it will persist, but you can't add any more. <coughs> but progressive web apps have support way beyond Google, so my, my guess is they'll be around for a while. I just want to conclude with a – well, no, not quite conclude. It's, uh, so is it worth the trouble? I, I, I was looking at my um, – under the hood of this website, and, and under the hood, my, on my administrative page, the pages are listed in the order in which I created them. And this is the second one I created. <laughs> So I very early on I was thinking, God, is this really worth the trouble? I, th I, think, I think maybe it is. I think maybe it's worth the trouble in, insofar as it makes the, it, in terms of converting, say, one of my rich syllabi into a progressive web app, I think that will be useful to my students, which is, after all, what this whole conference is about, right? The technology being, making technology useful to students. I think it will be useful to my students because it will function offline, um, it, it will cache content as, as they go through the syllabus. I, I provide podcasts of my classes, at, and, and so as they, as they pull up one class and, and have it on their device, it will all be cached, and so they'll be able to access it offline, which I think will be useful. I think I, I, think I still have a whole lot of work to do, though, to make that syllabus look like a, a web app. It doesn't, it, at the moment, it's, it, it's okay as a website, but it's ugly as a web app. So I, I might need to do something about that. At first, I was frustrated by the fact that I had to have HTTPS in order to make it work. Um, but, I get, but I guess now that I have it, I, it's not so frustrating. Just a very brief, um, well, the text there is too small. Um, one of my complaints back in 2012 was that, uh, or one of my suggestions, whether the Chrome app was, was better than a, an e-book because the, to the extent that the e-book, um, EPUB 3 standard was, it was out there, but, it, but nobody was supporting it. I, I was I was fully expecting that now that the ebook because the ebook format looks a whole lot like the Chromebook did. It's a it's a manifest file with a whole bunch of stuff in it. The problem with the ebook format is that it has so much stuff. You have to def, you have to I, you have to define the whole. You have to define the book, the chapters, and and yeah, it's it's a complicated. But you have to define the whole book and in terms of all the content. Uh, and I find that um, a frustrating thing to do. But basically, it, it wraps it up into a – it's a website wrapped up into a, into a zip file that then you need a reader to read. Now, my assumption was that all browsers would eventually support it natively, but they don't. You have to get, you have to get an extension or – I mean, you can't just open an ebook in Chrome and have it function. You have to that, – that, that, there's more to it than that. Um, but I will say this, it, it, it may be, it, in spite of that, maybe it makes, since most, it, at least in terms of course content, I like, by the way, the possibility that I will be able to send push notifications to students who have my syllabus. But I think it would be useful to be able to send a push notification to say the syllabus has been modified in such and such. Well, that seems to me to be a useful thing. You can't do that with an ebook, But to the extent that the content is static, and, and not, not, won't change for the whole semester, it might make sense to put it in an ebook rather than in a progressive web app. But if you're delivering it as from a website and, and 
occasionally updating it from the website, then a progressive web app might make some sense. I do this in my classes, you know. I, I start out thinking, I didn't say it today, but I start out telling my students, let's have a conversation, and then I do all the talking. <laughs> so any, any comments, questions, complaints? What sort of feedback do you get from the students on the apps? On the Chrome apps, I, got, I, I haven't done this yet, so they haven't seen the progressive web app yet, but on the Chrome apps, at least initially, when, when I was still able to do it, they liked it. Does it seem to make them read the syllabus anymore than they would have if you weren't using that delivery mechanism? That I hesitate to say. Um, I mean, and I certainly didn't do any, any testing to see if those who had the app were better prepared than those who didn't. So I couldn't say. But, I, but they did seem to find it useful. What, what stuff gave you the most headaches? This Process. Well, other than the fact that I have absolutely no artistic talent, so the icon, the, the icons always slow me down. But 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 that's not really the big deal. The, the biggest deal was was figuring out the service worker and, and how the how the caching mechanism works in the service worker. There are, there are examples online so that you can pull up if if you just pull up service worker caching service worker, you'll you'll get an example. On and I basically took an example and worked my way through it and twiddle around with it. Had to do some stuff to it in order for it to work with my authenticated site. Um, so, I, so I got past the problem with the manifest and authentication. I got past the problem with the service worker and authentication, but I can't get past the fact that the web app just won't prompt for credentials. I can't figure that out. But I'm not alone, apparently, in not being able to figure that out. But the service worker is the hardest part, the hardest part of the learning curve. Since you marked under the PWA column about content updating, uh, so in the library world, and I imagine it's also true on the faculty side as well, the push to try to update often and regularly can hit the limitation of how many hours in the day and how much staff do I have. Uh, those papers don't get created if you have to just spend every week three or four hours updating the app. So I'm just curious in your balancing, I know you said you're still sort of trying to figure out what, like at what point you cross the threshold where this seems really worth it. But I'm just curious in terms of the updating, do you have a sense of how often an update would be making you that worthwhile? I have a couple of reactions to that. One, one is in terms of the content, because I've been doing this for a very long time, I, I have just lots and lots of content, right? So, so and, and the content I have is not changing very much from time to time, from semester to semester, except when the Supreme Court gets it wrong in yet another case and I have to update the content for, for substantive reasons. Um, so in terms of push notifications, it, it won't happen very often. So, uh, so what you're so suggesting, I mean, I could just as easily email blast the students that we're having a snow day, or, um, or I could send a push notification. Um, so, so in terms of how often that's going to happen, not very often, and the fact that it's not going to happen very often might make it not worth it, except that I'm not going to convert it to an ebook because that's too, just too much trouble. Now that I've gone through the learning curve here, converting <coughs> it to a progressive web app has actually become a plausible thing to do. And I do think it would be useful to students to be able to just have the course sitting on their device's home screen and click on it when they need to. So, so, it's, wor so it's, it's worth it because I've gone through the learning curve to get here. Um, I don't know if it's worth it for anybody else. All of them, like, I agree that students love having a dynamic both syllabus and module content thing as an app. Smartphones are going up anyway. I'm just wondering on the creation side for the faculty or for librarians or for IT, the management aspect of this. 
terms of gathering the content, updating the content, and then releasing it in a timely way that makes it seem perhaps it's more dynamic than it actually is? Do you have any insight on how that? I guess I would say if you, if you don't already have web content that you're by through which you're delivering information to students anyway I wouldn't start I wouldn't start over doing something that you're not doing just in order to do it with a web app but if you already have web content it seems to me it would be useful to convert it to a, to a, to an app but but not to do it from scratch just for the sake of having an app is there a way to track how many not built into the app. Um, there are probably ways that I can, you know, look at the the, the server statistics of, and, but but not built into the app per se. No. Out else, as we say in Yorkshire. <laughs> Right, well thank you very much.